And a good morning this fine Mother's Day. We're so glad you're here. See lots of faces, smiling faces. If you would, stand with me and we will proclaim an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Is an awesome God. And our next hymn, I will sing the mercies of the Lord. sing of the mercies of the Lord forever I will sing I will sing I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever I will sing of the mercies of the Lord with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness thy faithfulness with my mouth will I make known Thy faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. You can be seated. And before I say anything else, happy Mother's Day to you mothers. Thank you, Roger. Roger is for you. Roger and me appreciate you. We're going to show a quick video, and then I'll come right back. Mom's going to love this. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? She deserves it. She's a great mom. Okay. What are we missing? We got the eggs, the juice, the muffins, got the bacon, cereal, oatmeal. Dad, nobody likes oatmeal. Hey, I know we got chocolates for your mom, but there was something else that she wanted for Mother's Day. What was it? Was it a new Bible? Look how worn out that thing is. Dad, gotta start watching out for these things. I bet it was a spa day. I bet it was a new car. Uh, definitely not a new car. She's basically my personal Uber driver. We could both use the upgrade. <laughs> no. Was it those fuzzy socks? Dad, you get that for her every holiday. She has like a thousand of them. Is it one of those candles that she puts in our bedroom? Hold on. Why does she only put that on my side? What was it she wanted for Mother's Day? <laughs> oh. What's up, buddy? The sled man! <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> we clearly owe you brunch after church. <laughs> what you owe me is a nap. Yes, yes we do. All right, man. How many of you have been there? Come on. Let's have some honesty in God's house this morning. Amen. 
Boy, wow, hallelujah, amen. Well, we're glad you're here, and if you didn't know by now, it is Mother's Day, and we do celebrate uh, our mothers today, and uh, if you're a mother today, thank you so much for being with us, and we do have something special for you today, so on the way out this morning, make sure you stop by, we'll be out in the lobby there, we've got a couple gifts we'd like to give you, and just thank you for sharing part of your Mother's Day with us this morning, so thank you so much for being with us. If you are a mother, would you do this, would you stand for us this morning, please? If you are a mom, stand up. All right, everybody look around and realize these are the people responsible for all us, all right? And uh, some of them had a tough job, amen? Let's give our ladies a hand this morning, amen. Thank you. You can be seated, ladies. We appreciate you, and hopefully uh, somebody within your clan has told you the same thing, amen? And thank you for being with us. Let me just real quick see if we have any first-time guests this morning. Your very first-time guest. We want to welcome you this morning. We got one back here. All right, anybody? We have one couple right up here as well. They're going to come give a speech here in just a moment. Uh, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm picking on them, but uh, they're related to Heidi, ish, Chris. But uh, and I told them we wouldn't hold that against them. So y'all show them some love this morning. All right, and. uh, I'm just giving her a hard time as well. Right over here, Roger. If you would do this, if you just fill that card out for us, um, I'll meet you in the lobby after church as well. And I got a gift I'm going to give you just for being here with us today. And I'll trade that little piece of paper for something nice to send home with you, all right? And again, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we want to welcome you. And of course, if you saw them, uh, those who raise your hands, make sure that you greet them. If not, if you haven't already, make sure you do before the day's out, all right? And we thank you for that. So before we uh, do any more singing this morning, I'm going to pray and ask God to bless the service. And then when I'm finished playing, uh, (laughs) shut up, Jackie. (laughs) Jackie came to our ladies uh, banquet yesterday and had the prices right. And they all were name tags. And she wanted one that said, shut up, Jackie, because I say that to her so often. But it's always out of love, Jackie. You know that, right? Okay. All right. Amen. Amen. So let's, I'm going to pray, not play. Okay. And when I finish praying, Uh, Mona's going to sing for us, and then we'll come back, and we'll sing some songs together this morning. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your love. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, thank you for our mothers. Uh, Lord, the mothers that are represented here today, and and even those that maybe could not be with us today, those that are in heaven, uh, those that are in other states, Lord, uh, we are so grateful for uh, the mothers that have given part of their day in their time to be with us today to celebrate here in God's house. We pray that you'll give them a special blessing for being here. We pray that you'll watch over their families, Lord, guide, lead and give wisdom to their families. And we just ask you to meet with us now in this service, Lord, as we sing, as we worship, as we praise, as we pray, as we preach. Lord, just everything we do today, we ask, Lord, that you will be glorified, you will be honored, you will be lifted up, and that you will draw people to the Father, we pray. Uh, Father, bless our service now and work in our midst, we pray. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. that 
that when you kiss that little baby, you've kissed the face of God. Thank you, Mona. And our next song is Great is the Lord. See, he proves his love. 
great are you, Lord, and worthy of glory. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of praise. Great are you, Lord, I lift up my voice, I lift up my voice. Great is the Lord, great are you, Our next hymn is Hallelujah, What a Savior. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was He. Full atonement, can it be? Hallelujah, what a Savior. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed. His child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed. Redeemed, his child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footstep and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. Amen. Isn't it good to be a child of the King this morning? Amen. I have that privilege spiritually as well as physically. I am a child of the King. Amen. My last name's King, in case you never mind. Come on, Jackie, get with it. Amen. 
Well, we want to do something special for our mothers today. Uh, we have done this the last year or two, and it seems to have a pretty uh, nice addition to the service. And uh, so my, my kids are getting ready. They're going to help me out here, get this ready for us. But uh, many people on Mother's Day comes, and it's a little different for them than it is for many others. Uh, many of you today do not have your mother uh, here in your presence on earth anymore, and uh, they are in the presence of Christ. And uh, we want to honor them uh, this morning, and we want you to be able to honor them this morning. So what we do is this. Uh, at the back here, we have got a big bucket full of carnations. And if you are here today, uh, ladies, and you have lost your mother and she is no longer with us, we'd like for you to slip to the back there and grab a carnation and just come down here. We're going to lay this on the rocking chair as a symbol of honor to those ladies and to those mothers who are in heaven. And then we'll have a word of prayer for everybody here in just a minute of that. So if you're ladies, if that is you and uh, you fit into that category, your mom's in heaven, would you slide back and grab a, a flower real quick and then just make your way right back up here to our rocking chair. And we want to honor them this morning. If you've got your flower, just make your way on down. A lot, of, a lot of flowers this morning represent a lot of, of, of precious ladies uh, who are no longer with us. And although I obviously did not have the privilege of knowing probably all of them, uh, other than maybe one or two of you since I've been here, uh, we thank God for the influence they've had in your lives, in the lives of others, and the impact that they've had. And rather than making you ladies come back at the front or stand even for just a moment, uh, if you would, church, if you'd join us, just bow our heads and let's have a word of prayer. And let's ask blessings uh, upon these uh, ladies that have uh, honored their mother this morning with this carnation. Let's pray together. Father, uh, Lord, we, we thank you uh, this morning for your love for us. We thank you for heaven. Uh, Lord, we thank you that the way to heaven is plain, it's simple, it's clear. And Lord, many of these ladies this morning lay a, a flower here on our rocking chair to symbolize a lost mother. Uh, Lord, and, and although she's no longer in our presence, uh, Lord, we pray that you will comfort the lady that's represented this morning, the daughter. We pray that you'll give her peace. We pray that you'll give her strength, Lord. And although mourning is normal and natural, even over a period of many, many years, Lord, the loss of a loved one is difficult. We pray that, Lord, you'll help fill the void that's left in their heart with your love, with your strength, with your wisdom and mercy and guidance. And, Lord, just provide for these ladies, Lord, for you, especially on this Mother's Day uh, weekend, Lord, as we celebrate moms, Lord. I know it's hard. Uh, for this to be brought up at this particular time. So uh, give them courage, uh, Lord, give them strength. Uh, watch over each one of these ladies that is represented this morning, we pray. We thank you for the influence that their mom had in their lives. We trust, Lord, that uh, you'll use the, the daughter now uh, to continue to serve you and to go forth uh, representing you and making a difference here uh, in, the, in the life in which she has here on earth, we pray. Thank you again uh, for these mothers that are represented. We pray that you'll bless their daughters now today. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We're going to do one other thing this morning. And uh, we 
added this in last year, and I think it was a nice little touch as well. But many of our mothers today have lost a child, and whether that be through a, uh, a birth situation or a car accident or a disease or whatever it may have been. Uh, many of our moms today no longer have one of their children with them here on earth. And uh, we'd like to give you an opportunity as well to honor uh, your child. And so if that is you, ladies, uh, you can go ahead and head to the back again. We've got more flowers. Uh, some of you fall into both categories. And we want to honor your child as well this morning. So if you want to make your way back there, and uh, we'll have you come and add your flower to the honorary chair this morning. More flowers added. I am thankful that it was fewer. But real, nonetheless. Sorry. <laughs> we thank you, ladies, for allowing us to share a little bit in your sorrow, in your grief this morning. And let's have a word of prayer uh, for those ladies, please, that just uh, are represented uh, by this last load of carnations here. Father, uh, Lord, I I can't say that I know what it's like to lose a child. But Lord, several of our ladies this, this morning have, have represented that. And God, I pray this morning, especially on Mother's Day, that you will give them an extra measure of your grace, an extra measure of your mercy and your strength. And Lord, may they realize that even though we don't understand why maybe a child was taken at a young age or too early in life, Lord, we know that you have a plan. And Lord, I pray that you'll help these ladies even as they deal with uh, this sorrow and grief in their life. I pray that they also will trust you through it and allow you to work and strengthen and guide and mold and shape, Lord, where we need that. Now, Father, we thank you for these ladies that are here. Thank you for uh, their willingness to come and, and share this flower, Lord, and give us a chance to share uh, in their grief, and we pray, Lord, that we will be an encouragement to them as well. May we be uh, uh, added encouragement and strength and uh, uh, love, Lord, in their lives, we pray. We thank you again, Lord, for these lives that are represented. Continue to use these mothers now uh, in the way that you would see fit and uh, to bring honor and glory to your name, we pray. We thank you again for all these people that have been honored this morning, and we thank you for these mothers that are here and the ones that are participating in this especially. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, ladies. We appreciate you. And again, the loss is real. We understand that. And we are here for you. If we can do anything, please uh, do not hesitate to let us know. At this time, Alicia's going to come. I was looking back to make sure she wasn't crying because then I was going to say, well, let's wait a few minutes. I did it for you. You don't have to worry about it. But uh, she's going to come and she's going to sing for us. And uh, then I'll come back up and, and uh, preach in just a moment. She 
Without the battle that was won on Mama's knees. She always keeps her Bible close by her side. Many pages are tear stained, many verses underlined. She stands upon those promises when she kneels to pray. And when my world falls apart, she helps me keep the faith. I've seen her tears of sorrow for loved ones bound by sin. But until they come back to God, she'll be on her knees again. She bows before the throne. Only angels lift their wings. Mama prays. She knows how to pray. When she lifts her voice to heaven, Mama always takes the time to mention me. I'm so glad she prays for me. where I'd be without the battles that were won on Mama's knees. She's a woman of faith, and she taught me how to live. Lord, help me to be a prayer warrior like she is. the battles that were won on Mama's knees. Only God knows where I'd be without the battles that were won on Mama's knees. Thank you, Alicia. Appreciate that song. I could not have sung that for a variety of reasons. But uh, thank you so much. Appreciate that. And nothing like a mother's prayer. And I think that probably many of us in this room would say we are today a product of a praying mother. And looking at some of you, I know you put your mother through a lot. Jay. <laughs> The patience and the prayer of a mother. Boy, without that, we sure will be in a lot of trouble. Amen. And thank God for our mothers today. We're going to turn this morning to several different passages. I am not going to have you stand this morning because we're not going to read one to begin with. Uh, we're going to turn to several other ones and you can follow along if you want. Second Kings 4 is where we're going to start here in just a moment. Um, but... Mother's Day, to me, and I've talked to other pastors as well. I've talked to my dad a little bit. By the way, hi, Mom. I love you. 
she might watch. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> I should have said it at the beginning because then she say she turned it on and shut it off. Didn't have to listen to the rest. But anyways, I love mom. But anyways, uh, Mother's Day is to me a very difficult day for sermon preparation. Um, I try to as pastor, not every holiday or everything, but I try to try to preach something along the line. You know, if it's 4th of July, let's have something patriotic and uh, Christmas, obviously, you know, let's talk about the resurrection of Christ. It, I was just seeing if you were listening, apparently you weren't, the birth of Christ, uh, you know, Easter, obviously, you know, and, and Father's Day and Mother's Day, and Memorial Day, those types of things, Veterans Day, we try, to, we try to somewhat be specific, but Mother's Day to me is a very difficult message to preach. Uh, some of you in this room would say, man, I had a great mom, and I, I just want to celebrate her. Some of you in this room might be thinking, my mother was not so great. I'm trying to forget her. I'm trying to put, go past some of maybe the cruelness that was displayed in my life. Some of you have lost your mom, as we, we saw just a few moments ago, uh, to death. Some of you are in distance far away from your mother. Uh, some today might not have a good relationship with their mother. Some might have a thriving relationship with their mother. Some moms, as we saw a moment ago, have lost a child to death. Some have uh, lost a child to distance. Uh, some maybe to a destroyed relationship. Some today in our churches wish to become a mom and can't. And, and they deal with that. Then on Mother's Day we have men in here. Who I don't care what society says cannot be mothers. Okay. And, and, and children. Children. And, and, and teenagers, I know Ben aspires to be a great mom one day, but I'm kidding, I'm teasing him, but they're not mothers, have no desire or anticipation or possibility to become a mother, right? Yet they're here today in church. And I have the great honor of trying to preach to that vast group. I'm going to try this morning to do my best, and I'm trying to do something a little different than I've done in the past. I want to give you this morning four examples from Scripture of mothers uh, and what they were going through. We're going to read the account in Scripture of what they did. We're going to share their story with you this morning. And, and what I want to do is from each story, each account, I'm going to pull out just one truth. Okay? So you're going to get four truths. You're going to get four Mother's Day sermons in one. Okay? Four truths from four stories. And that's it. I have no subpoints. I have no jokes. I have no poems. Um, I'm sorry. All right. Uh, th this is this is what I really feel like the Lord has given us this morning to look at. And uh, afterwards, we have a free gift for all of our moms. That's all that matters. Amen. So uh, you uh, <laughs> you sit back. You listen up. Uh, four Mother's Day sermons in one. Uh, one, but but again, I think each one has a really phenomenal truth that we can pull out. That is a universal application to everyone. Whether you're a mom, a wannabe mom, a widow, a husband, a, a child, a teenager, I think every truth that we point out from this mother's story is something we can all apply and say, wow, I can use that. And so that's what I want to try to do this morning. We'll see how well I do at it, but we're going to try, all right? So welcome. Good to see you. <laughs> Number one, I want to look at this morning from Scripture, a desperate mother who sought wisdom from Elisha. A desperate mother who sought wisdom from Elisha. I'm going to pray real quick, okay? Um, and just, I know we prayed a lot already. I want to pray real quick and just ask God's help on the message. Father, uh, lead, guide, and direct this morning. Lord, you know what we need. You know, Lord, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not qualified to preach this message. But, Lord, you are worthy. Lord, guide my lips, my tongue, my thoughts. Direct what is said. May you use it, Lord, to encourage not just our mothers today, but everyone that might be listening. May these universal truths, these uh, applications be applied to our lives, Lord, to help each and every one of us in our walk with you. Lord, if there's somebody here today or watching us that does not know you, may they realize even through the Mother's Day service how much you love them. Enough to send your son Jesus to die for them. And Lord, may today be the day they realized their need for you and your love for them. And may they turn their hearts and their lives to Christ today. Father, just bless everything that's said and done. The remainder of this service we pray. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. 
a desperate mother who sought wisdom from Elijah. I want to take your attention this morning to 2 Kings chapter number 4. And we'll look at the first seven verses. Again, we're going to look at four different passages. So I'm not going to have you sit up and stay down, sit down, stand up and sit down. Okay, we're going to let you remain seated. 2 Kings chapter 4 and look at the, the first seven verses. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the son of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elijah said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and thou shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil. Hallelujah, praise King Jesus. Pay your debt and live Thou and thy children on the rest. Live thou and thy children on the rest. A desperate mother who sought wisdom from Elijah. Second Kings chapter 4 tells a story of a widower whose husband was the son of one of the prophets of Elisha. He had trained under him. He had learned ministry under him. He was a friend of Elisha. He had seen God work through Elisha and even in his own life. He had passed away and he left her with two boys and no money. He left her with two boys, no money, in a, in a, in a mountain of bills. Uh, he had left her. He obviously did not uh, have life insurance. All right. By the way, man, do the best thing you can do for your family is to invest in life insurance. I am not an insurance salesman, but if I would, I would tell you that. All right. Best thing you can do for your family. All right. At a young age, invest in life insurance. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. All right. Back to the message. He didn't have life insurance, so he left her with two sons and a mountain of bills. Under Mosaic law, she was prohibited from doing what most people would do today. I'll just declare bankruptcy. Uh, that was not an option. The option that she had presented to her was very simple. You give the debtors, the creditors, your two sons in exchange for your bills being paid off, and they can work it off. Obviously, as a parent, as a mother today, you're going to look at that and say, I, I don't think that's a good option. Those are my kids, right? Now, some of you be like, yes, please take them, please, please. And my husband, too. If I, but Not a good idea. So she goes to the man of God, the prophet Elisha, and, and they're speaking. And Elisha says, uh, okay, let, how are we going to work through this? And her expectation of God's provision was very limited at the beginning. Elisha asked her in verse 2, what do you have in your house? Her response is, nothing except this little pot of oil. Nothing except this little pot of oil. Well, how many times in Scripture have we seen? Oh, we're out of wedding, we're out of drink. Oh, we're in the wilderness and there's 5,000 plus people and we only have five loaves and two fishes. Oh, God, you've called me to lead your people out of bondage, but all I have is a stick. Oh, God, you want me to go fight the Goliath, that big old giant, but all I have is five stones and a sling. How many times do we see in Scripture this very same scenario all I have is, sounds so familiar. And this mom says to Elisha, all I have is this little bitty pot of oil. I am so thrilled this morning that a little pot of oil is enough for God. A little stick in my hand is enough for God. A little stone in my pouch is enough for God. She says, I just have a little bit of oil. And here's the awesome thing. This woman finds a solution for her problems in her very own home. She didn't have to go to Walmart, amen, praise King Jesus. Sorry, Ramona. Man, you're here and I pick up Walmart, I'm sorry. It was in the message, sorry. Was, all right, you're, you know, she didn't have to, you know, get on Amazon, have something shipped to her house. What she needed, she already had. It was in her house. Elisha's question is a good one for all mothers today, all, all people today, all who trust in God today, and I would ask the question that he would ask, and that would be this, what do you already have that God can use? What do you already have that God could use? The widow tells Elisha, uh, here's what I have. 
And Elisha says, well, let's take that. And, of course, we see how the story un unfolds. They go and they borrow all the vessels from their neighbors and from their family and from their friends and, 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 and from the people down the road and maybe even their enemies. And they get, bring all these empty pots and she pours all that oil. And that pot of oil never runs out until every vessel is filled. Now, if you can't see the miracle of God in that, you're blind, <laughs> okay? What an amazing miracle that takes place there. And then he says, here's what you're going to do. You're going to take that oil and sell it. And you're going to pay off your debt. But you know how good God is. God says, not only am I going to take what you already have. This is, this is gooder and gooder. Not only is God going to take what you already have and pay your bills off with it, he's going to take what you already have and bless you in such a way you can live the rest of your life off of it. You talk about a mighty good God, amen? God multiplied it so she could pay off her debt and then live the rest of her life with her boys on what she did with what she already had. Folks, the takeaway is very simple. Whatever you have, is enough for God to use for his good purpose. Too many moms today comparing themselves with the moms represented on Facebook and, and social media. Oh, but her kitchen is, and oh, but her cooking is, and oh, but her kids are. You know what? It's all a lie because all you show is what's the best about you. I am sorry. I, when I post on Facebook, I do not show my dirty socks on the floor right beside the hamper. Sean does. That's right. No, we show the nice, clean, you're right. But, but so many times in our life, we're so busy comparing ourselves with somebody else. Or if I only had what they have, if, if, I, if I could only do what they do, if God would only bless me like he's blessed them, boy, if I had this at my disposal, I could. The reality is this, the many times God doesn't give us those things because we're not using the things we already have. And when God has blessed us with something, here's what it is. doesn't matter how big or how small or how, how, how monumental we think it is or how minuscule we think it is. If we'll put that in God's hands, God can do good with it. That little boy's lunch. Think about what would happen had he not offered that little lunch. We can go on and on and on throughout the illustrations throughout Scripture. What you have is enough for God to use. I do not need to sit back and wait for God to give me more. I do not need to sit back and say, God, if you would, then I could. God needs to treat me like Elisha. What you got in the house, boy? What do you already have that I can use? Moms, listen, you don't have to compete for mother of the year. Doesn't matter. You don't have to compete for, for your sister, your aunt, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers' approval as a mother. Okay? What you have as a mom is enough. But I'm not, I, I don't care. But I don't, it doesn't matter. If you turn that over to Jesus Christ, what you have is enough. And again, that, that, that truth is applicable for anyone. I'm, I'm specifically talking to Bob today. I get that. But this applies to everyone. What you have is enough. We learn this from a, from a woman who is desperate in her situation. About to lose her children. And God says, hey, you already have what you need. Just turn it over to me, surrender it to me, and let me bless it. And God does that. That's number one. Number two, I want to look at another lady in Scripture. I want to look at a diligent mother whose choice impacted generations. And I want you to see that word. That, that word is plural. Generations. Okay? I think a lot of people think my influence stops with my children. Uh, the choices I make, the decisions I make, the faith that I share, the faith that I live cannot just affect my children. It can affect literally generations after my children. And I want to look at a diligent mom whose faith and her choice of, 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 of promoting and using her faith impacted literally generations to follow. Turn your attention, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 23 through 27. Of course, this is the great faith chapter. Uh, and this talks about many people who showed faith in Scripture. And I want to point out a person in Scripture that shows great faith. But the reason he was able to show great faith was because of the mother that was involved in his life. Look at verse, uh, if you're there with me, verse number 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. They were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called 
the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Boy, how much, how much trouble we would avoid if we could claim that scripture right there every day of our lives. Amen. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Uh, what a tremendous verse there. Uh, by faith, when he was come to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughters. Jochebed, Moses' mother, uh, was an Israelite. She gave birth to Moses at a time when her nation was under uh, Egyptian oppression. A, a time when uh, the Israelites were, were in slavery and in bondage to the Egyptian nation. She also gave birth to her son during a time where an edict or a verdict had been passed, a commandment had been given by the Pharaoh that all male Jewish babies born were to be immediately killed. Her faith amongst distressing circumstances at best is a good model for all of us. Scripture tells us in Exodus 2, 2 that Moses was a goodly child. Acts chapter 7 tells us Moses was exceeding fair in God's sight. Something about Moses was unique. And by law, Moses should have been executed. By law, Jochebed could have been executed for not executing Moses. But yet her faith said, there's something about this child. There's something about um, this child. God has a plan for him. I don't know what it is, but I'm willing to allow God to work. The Bible is clear in Acts chapter 5 that man should obey uh, uh, God rather than man. I think Jochebed knew that before it was even written. She knew that God was in charge. Uh, you know, you think about this, you think this, realize this, Jesus always values life over the law. Always values life over the law. You remember on the Sabbath day, all the, all the rules and all the regulations? And if you remember in Matthew chapter 12, he said, you know, if, if you have a sheep that, that falls into a pit on the Sabbath day, you're going to let it die or you're going to save it? You're going to save it, knucklehead, <laughs> right? Well, he doesn't say that, obviously. That's me adding my emphasis in there. <laughs> I don't think the word knuckle is in the Bible, but anyways. Life is more important, and Jochebed knew that. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23 said, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents. Do you realize that Jochebed's decision to give birth to Moses, to put him in that basket, to put him in the bulrushes and hide him for those months, do you realize that that set into motion the rest of Moses' life? Had she not by faith done that, the rest of the story of Moses would be drastically different, if at all. Eventually, uh, he would be established within the Egyptian community. He would rise up within the palace of the Pharaoh. And eventually, he would end up leading his very own people out of bondage from the nation of Egypt. God's miraculous design. She puts that baby in that little basket. And she puts him down in the Nile River. And just by coincidence... Come on, you know where I stand on that. It wasn't a coincidence. A woman found this baby, and that woman, by coincidence, just happened to be the Pharaoh's daughter. Come on, man. It ain't coincidence. This is the divine plan of an almighty God. But it started with the faith of Jochebed to say, I'll do it. I'll hide my child. I'll, I'll, I'll rebel against the king's command. I'll put my own life on the line. I'll do this because I believe life is more important than the law. Boy, I wish we believed that today in our country. Amen. And so she put that baby. She hit, Pharaoh's daughter is down there in the Nile. She finds this baby by coincidence. She takes the baby in. Of course, she needs a nurse for the baby. Let me just show you some more coincidence. It just happens by coincidence that Jochebed is then given the, the, the opportunity to be the nurse for Moses until he's weaned. This isn't coincidence. Again, it's the divine purpose of Almighty God. So Jochebed takes care of her child until it's time to return him to the Pharaoh's daughter. And, and she does. But you say, during that time, Jochebed must have, again, I know kids are kids, but you know the first five years of a kid's life are the most formative years. This, this is the time where a parent or a mother especially can impact their child the most. And she must have during this time passed on some of her faith in God to Moses. 
some of her faith. Why? You say, well, why? Because verse number 24, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. By faith, verse 27 says, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Why? Because he saw him who was invisible. Jochebed's decision to follow her faith of her ancestors, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, then impacted the son of Moses, who, by the way, later led the entire nation of Israel out of bondage. Where would Israel have been without Moses? But Moses couldn't have gotten to where he was had his mother not stepped out in faith and made a choice that impacted generations. It's an example for all mothers. It's an example for all parents. And by the way, whether you're a physical blood parent or an adopted parent, a step parent, I don't care where we fall into that category. The reality is this, the choices we make can influence generations. Not just our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, maybe an entire community, maybe an entire nation like Moses. Spiritual parents, discipling other Christians and building up in, in their relationship with the Lord. The impact of my faith has the chance to change many lives. I, I, I put down this thought to take away. We can impart our faith and potentially reach generations. And again, whether you're a mom, whether you're a dad, whether you're a teenager, whether you're a child this morning, doesn't matter where we find ourselves. The reality is this, if I will live out the faith that God has given me, and I'll live by real true faith, and, and I'll keep God first, and I'll put Him first, and I'll live that way, the opportunity I have is to reach generations to follow. This mom did not find herself in a great position, but her faith led to a great result, did it not? How's our faith this morning? How's our faith? How's our realization that my faith affects generations? How many times you heard pastor preach, your sin doesn't just affect you, it affects those around you. That's right. You know, the same thing's true with our faith on the opposite side of the coin. My living for God, my preaching Christ, my representation of the gospel, my, my stepping out in faith, even when I don't understand or see the big picture, can, can also affect those around me. Jochebed, what an example this morning. What an example. Uh, she was diligent in making sure that her choices of faith impacted generations. When we follow her example this morning. Let me give you number three. Number three. I want to look at a distraught mother who kept her promise. A distraught mother who kept her promise. First Samuel chapter number one. We're not going to read the entire chapter. But you find this story played out over the entire chapter. I want to look specifically at verse 21 through 28. Uh, Elkanah, uh, Hannah's husband... Uh, they're going down to offer their yearly sacrifice and to pay their vow at the temple. Hannah did not go, and here's the reason why. If you look at verse 21, the man of Canada and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up. For she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child is weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good, tarry until thou have weaned him. Only the Lord established his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and an ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as thy soul liveth, I am the woman that stood by, by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. I want to look at a woman this morning uh, who, let me get back here to our thing, who kept her promise. A woman who kept her promise. Uh, Hannah here is a, is a woman that was not able to have children. And she would go to the temple often and she would pray for God to give her a, a child. One evening, sitting at the, at the door of the temple at Shiloh, she made a vow to God. Verse number 11 of, of 1 Samuel chapter 1. She said, if you'll look on the affliction of your handmaid and remember me and not forget me I, uh, and give me a, a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. God hears this prayer. God listens to her prayer and grants her request. And she has a son and she names him Samuel. If you know anything about Bible names or have studied Bible names, the word Samuel means I have asked for him of the Lord. That's literally what it means, asked for the Lord. 
And, and of course, God grants her the request. Now, let me ask you a question. How easy would it have been for Hannah to forget the promise she made to God? He blessed me with this child. I hold him tightly. I want to raise him up. I want to bring him up as mine. And, and like other mother, any other mother, I'm sure she was deeply attached to her son. But what you find different about Hannah in this passage of scripture is, no matter the feeling she had, no matter the love that she had, she still kept her word. Rather than pretending she never said it, rather than going back on her commitment and her vow, uh, she said, I will, like verse 28 said, I will lend him to the Lord. By the way, parents, can I just say this real quick? This is a side note, not in my, not in my, my, my notes, and this is a parenthesis, okay? This is a freebie. Our children are not ours anyways. God has lend it, lend, lend it, loaned, lent, lent. Let's use a scripture. He's lent them to us. And we are stewards of all that God has given us, including our children. We're to do the best we can with what God has given us, but they're his in the long run. And these, I'm going to be mad, I'm going to be mean this morning. These stingy parents, selfish, I don't want my, God, my, my child to go to the mission field or get involved in serving Jesus. That doesn't pay very well. That's lonely. I'm going to miss them. Hey, they're not yours. They're his. And and so Hannah says this, if you give them to me, I know he's not mine. I'm going to turn around and give them back to you anyways. What a great decision she made. And so she weaned him. She finally brings him to the temple, young Samuel. And she presents him to Eli, the high priest. He takes him up under his wing. He trains the child to be a minister in the temple. The Bible tells us that Samuel grew in wisdom. He grew in favor with, with the Lord. He eventually was, was confirmed as a prophet of God and a judge of, of the nation of Israel later. He anointed the very first and second king of the nation of Israel. This is the same guy. And by the way, Hannah was honored for her faithfulness. God gave her three more sons and two daughters. Why? She kept her promise. Was it easy? No. Was she distressed? I'm sure. Did she maybe question? I bet. But she kept her promise in the midst of not knowing what was going to happen. Folks, I want to just give you a takeaway this morning from that, and that is this. We cannot always see what God is doing behind the scenes when we surrender to Him. But... It's always worth surrendering. It's always worth surrendering. Our time, our talent, our treasure, our gifts, our children, whatever it may be, fill in the blank. If we'll surrender to him, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but he does. I I, I don't understand why he's going to do what he's going to do, but he does. It's always worth it. I don't see what's happening, but he knows. How many times have we refused or been hesitant about stepping out in faith because I don't see behind the scenes can i challenge your mothers listen i don't know what's going to happen you don't know what's going to happen with your children with your grandchildren with your if you're blessed to have great grandchildren how many have great grandchildren we got some greats in here do we have any great greats oh we got a couple great greats all right awesome you don't know what's going to happen when they're adults or teenagers if they're not that that far yet you don't know what's going to happen you know what god does and what, what comes into the role of play in my life is this. I'm going to say, God, you can have them. They're yours anyways. And God, I'm going to trust you to do what only you can do. Could you imagine how different our story would be if Samuel had been kept from God? If Hannah had not kept her promise? But the impact she made in just keeping her promise uh, influenced the entire nation. Again, generations just like Jochebed because of a mother who kept her promise. Moms, dads, children, teenagers, listen, you don't know what God is doing behind the scenes. The challenge is just to say, yes, Lord, anyways. The challenge is to say, all to Jesus, I surrender, anyways, and trust him with the end results. Uh, This mother kept her promise. Was it easy? No. Would I have done it? Mm, Can't say yes. Yes. I can't positively say, oh, yeah. But she kept her promise. And we see the blessings of God that fell upon it because she did. Let me give you this last one, number four. Number four. I want to look at a dying mother who provided for Elijah. Let me get back to where I need to be. Oh, it's not on there. But she didn't keep her promise. Well, she did, but (laughs) she's writing it down. A dying mother... Who provided for Elijah. Look at 1 Kings 17. 
And I want to look at uh, verse 8 through 16 here. The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get to the Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not. What a powerful two words. Not the first time and not the last time we'll see this in Scripture. Fear not. Fear not. Go and do as thou hast said. <laughs> now again, we're going to think, man, this, this old Elijah, man, he's got a lot of nerve. He's worried, about, he's worried about the Baptist potluck instead of the widow lady. What does he say? Wait a minute. Yeah, go, fear not. Go and do as thou hast said. Get your sticks and prepare. Prepare the meal. But make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she did, she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. The flour never ran out. The oil never ran out as long as she was obedient to what God asked her to do. This woman, when she meets the prophet Elijah in this passage, is ready to die. We read that. She's going out to get a couple of sticks. She's going out to prepare that last little bit of meal that she has, that last little bit of oil to make them, uh, combine them and make a cake to feed her and her son, then they're going to die. They're just going to starve to death. In the ancient world, in those days, widows were known for being impoverished. God tells Elijah, who is, by the way, fleeing from Ahab, to find provision from an impoverished widow in Zarephath. Why did he send him to an impoverished widow in Zarephath? Now think about it for just a minute, okay? A three and a half year drought had caused a famine in the land. Incredible hardship for all. Scripture tells us this woman is gathering sticks. because She's impoverished. She's getting ready to cook that last little bit of meal, that last handful, so that we can eat it and die. In her desperate situation, she took what little she had... Used it for God, and what happened? God provided. But you see, when you go back to verse number 9, you find out that before Elijah ever got there, God had spoken to the widow and told her exactly what was going to happen. I'm going to meet your needs. You just need to trust me. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide for you. You just need to trust me. So Elijah shows up in this desperate situation, and he says, hey, you know what? I'm hungry. I know what you just said you're going to do. You're going to go prepare what little bit you have left. You and your son are going to eat. You're going to die. That's the last meal you're going to have on this earth. But I'm hungry. Feed me first. Feed me first. You ever, you ever watch mom slave over a meal? We spent hours and hours and hours preparing it. And it's been laid out and it's ready to, to partake in. And the kids just. <laughs> and you're like, you didn't even leave a scrap for mom. You know, and she'll go. By the way, she'll go without. She won't complain. She'll, she'll do whatever's necessary. But, but, but he says, feed me first. Me first. Me first. Now, I know he wasn't doing that to be obnoxious or be rude or anything like that. He was simply doing what, what, what God had already challenged here in this particular passage of Scripture. But his request for food and water during a famine probably put this woman in either greater jeopardy financially. Very awkward. I don't have anything that you're asking for what little I have. But realize this. God chose this widow of Zarephath for a reason. Not just to be saved from famine. But to minister 
to his servant. To bless the prophet that he had at that particular time in the nation. Despite her fear, despite her distress, and probably despite her doubt, the woman said, you know what? God spoke to me. Elijah has now come. I'm going to trust the Lord to provide for me and my family. And Elijah gives her the two-word assurance that we hear so often throughout Scripture in verse 13. Fear not. Fear not. You ever, you ever gone to the refrigerator and it's empty? You went to the cupboard and it's empty. <laughs> you looked at your bank account and it's empty. <laughs> and you're like, I, I don't know how I'm going to eat this week, you know. You, we've been there. Probably all of us at some point in our life or somebody we know or somebody we were close to or family, growing, whatever. It's tight this week. I don't know how we're going to make it. Can you imagine this woman? I just told you, dude. I got a little flour, a little oil. I'm going to cook it. And for me and my son, we're going to die. And you have the audacity to ask me for food first. But she did what the scripture said. She did what Elijah asked for. She did what God had told her to do in verse number 9. And she says, okay. And she feeds Elijah. And you see a miracle that takes place? Elijah eats. She eats. Her son eats. And although we do not know the exact length of time, she ate. The whole household ate for, the Bible says, many days. Many days. And that flour and that oil never ran out until God brought rain again to the area and the famine ended. God honored the, the woman's obedience in this desperate situation. And it's a lesson for us all. And here's a lesson I want to take away. Jesus' grace is always sufficient. I don't know why God puts you through what he puts you through. I don't know why we suffer when we suffer. I don't know why hard times and valleys and trials have to be a part of our life. I don't know that. But what I do know is this. His grace is always sufficient to see me through. And mom, especially this morning, dad, teenager, child, whatever difficulty you might find yourself in today that you say, but pastor, you don't understand. I don't understand. But he does. His grace is always sufficient to see you through. You realize the grace of God has never lacked for a need or a problem that I've had in my life. Or yours. Or all of us combined. His grace is sufficient for every person in every circumstance. In every difficulty of life. And this widow lady, this dying mother with her child provided for Elijah obeyed God, and God took care of the rest. I don't know about you this morning, I am awful thankful for the grace of God. Not just for salvation, although that's where it starts. But you realize that daily I experience God's grace in my life. And daily God blesses me with more grace to handle what's in my life. And did you ever stop and think about this? Sometimes God puts me through things and gives me grace through that thing so that I can turn around and show somebody a grace when they're going through their thing. Y'all with me? I don't know what it's like to lose a mother. I don't know what it's like to lose a child. But maybe you've been in that situation and now you're sitting in a row with somebody else in that situation to give each other encouragement. To give each other strength. To provide for one another, to build one another up, and to edify each other. And God's grace will give you the ability to do that. Yes, I'm thankful for the amazing, all-sufficient grace of an almighty God. Moms, I know this is probably not a typical Mother's Day message. I don't know what a typical Mother's Day message should look like. <laughs> okay? I do know this. Mother's Day messages and Father's Day messages are always different. And Mother's Day, we say, Mom, you're awesome, you're great, you're doing a great job, keep it up. You're loved. And Father's Day comes, we're like, you bunch of buzzards, do better. <laughs> right? That's what the dads get. So come back on Father's Day, it's going to be a great message. <laughs> that seems to be the MO in most churches though, right? Mom, listen, I don't, I don't know where you find yourself, I don't know what you consider yourself as a mother, as a grandmother. Uh, again, I don't know the relationship that you have with your children or with your mother and every one of your lives. But what I do know is this. God has given all of us an awesome responsibility as Christians and as part of the family of God, whether that be mother, father, child, 
teenager, whatever it may be, where we find ourselves. God has given us a tremendous responsibility, and that's to teach people about the love of Christ. To teach people about a family that is never dysfunctional, amen? A family that's worth being a part of, the family of God. Wherever you find yourself this morning, I want to give you just one reminder. We're done. I'm, I'm, I'm finished. We're going to pray, give our mother's gifts, and we're going to go home, okay? Whatever you have is enough for God to use. Don't wait to get involved for the service of God. Don't wait to do something for God. Don't wait to make an impact until you've got more of what you think you need. What you have is enough because God is all sufficient. I don't need this. I don't need that. I don't need what you got. You don't need what I got. I need what I have, and God can provide the rest. Whatever you have is enough. Moms, listen. In this social media, Facebook, Instagram generation, okay, don't believe the hype. Don't believe the lies. Don't believe that you're not good enough. You don't have. You didn't go to enough parenting classes. Okay. You and God are enough. Are you gonna make mistakes? Yes. Is there forgiveness for those mistakes? Yes. Is there is there an enablement to do better from those? Yes. You have what you need. What you have is enough. Number two, you remember this, you have the opportunity to make a difference, not just in your lifetime, but in generations to follow. Will I, will I establish and show my faith in that capacity? Number three, I can't always see behind the scenes when I surrender, but surrender is always worth it. And again, whether that be of a child, a resource, uh, whatever it may be, it's always worth surrendering. And number four, remember this, Jesus' grace is sufficient for all. There is no situation that God does not have the grace to handle. There is no problem that God's grace cannot resolve. There's no burden. There's no valley. Uh, there's no heartache too big for God to say, you know what? I got you. I got you. Moms, this Mother's Day, especially, especially many of you that laid a flower here on our rocker. Can I just encourage you? Keep trusting God. Keep going forward in faith. Keep reaching the next generation. Because here's what you're going to find out. In 20 years, there's going to be a whole bunch of people in this room that aren't in this room anymore. Maybe in 10 years. Roger, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> right? I, I'm just saying, who, who's the future? Who's the future of the church? Who's the next leaders? Who's going to pick up the mantle of Elijah and step out like Elisha? It's the next generation. And if we're going to be honest, we really ought to remember this. The next generation is the church today, if you really think about it. And if we're not teaching and training and pushing and promoting our faith and letting them learn about the things of God and making God real in our lives so they see that he's real in their lives, the church is going to struggle in 20 years. We've already seen it begun in many of our churches today. Will we, will we choose to make a difference for generations? Whether you're a mom, a dad, a kid, a teenager, we can influence the next generation. And many to come if we will. I don't know where we find ourselves. I don't know where the message hits you today. I don't know if it helps you at all this morning. Again, I don't know how to preach a Mother's Day message. <laughs> I'm not a mother. But I see four real, real mothers with real stories. And every one of them has a real powerful point to show us. No matter where we are. No matter what gender we are. No matter where we find ourselves in life. Four powerful truths. We see a, we see a, a quartet of godly mothers. That if we'll apply those, these applications. I think they'll make us better Christians. Whether we're a mother or not. So this Mother's Day. Mothers, I salute you. I thank you. I, I, I'm so proud to have a, a godly mother, as I'm sure you are. And, and I'm thankful for those mothers today that are reaching the next generation and making a difference. And I want to challenge and encourage you to keep it up. Men, let's be supportive by realizing these things apply to us as well. Kids and teenagers, they apply to you as well. Let's, let's, let's have teamwork. Let's have teamwork making this work for the cause of Christ. We can make a difference if we'll just choose to do so. I thank God for these four examples, and I trust that we can use these applications in our lives to make us more like Him. Father, Lord, this morning I pray you'll take what has been said. Lord, I pray that you'll use it to challenge us. 
Use it, Lord, to encourage us. Use it, Lord, to help us, uh, Lord, do more for the cause of Christ, to step out and strengthen our faith, to walk with you, to trust you, to surrender to you, Lord, to allow you to have uh, preeminence in our lives, uh, even with our families and with our children and our grandchildren, Lord. May we allow you to have your will and your way. Lord, may we learn from these four examples in scriptures. Lord, may we learn these, these applications are, are, are wonderful for all of us. And may we apply them to our hearts and our lives today, I pray. Heads are bowed this morning, eyes are closed. We're going to have just a, a brief invitation this morning. We'll be done. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, uh, first of all, this Mother's Day, let me say this. It's great to be a part of a wonderful family, the family of God. And, and this morning, I would say this, Pastor, I am part of the family of God. I am a child of God, not because of my birth or my nationality or my good works or because I go to church. But there's been a day in my life where I realized that I was lost and in need of a Savior. And I trusted Jesus Christ as my only hope of heaven. And preacher, if I were to die right now, even in my seat, I'm on my way to heaven. And I know that. And again, it's not because of religion or, or, or good work. It's because I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Who is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh to the Father but by Him. You say, preacher, that is me. Would you do this again? Nobody's looking. We're, we're, we're finishing up. You say, preacher, that's me. If I were to die today, I know I'm going to heaven. Because of my relationship with Christ. Would you do this? Would you just slip your hand up? I just want to rejoice with you. Amen. Good, 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 good. Hands all over. Good, good. Put them down. Thank you, thank you. Amen. Maybe you're here today and you say, preacher, I... I had to be honest, I couldn't raise my hand. If I were to die today, I'm not 100% sure I'd go to heaven. I'd like to know that, obviously. I'd like to go there. But I cannot say that I'm positive. Would you pray for me? I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna do this. I'm not going to call your name. I'm not going to embarrass you. Could I pray for you this morning? I'm just not sure. Would you pray for me? I'd like to know heaven was my eternal home when I die. Would you pray for me? Would you do this? Nobody is looking. Would you just slip your hand up, slip everything? I just want to pray for you in a minute. Again, I'm not going to call your name or embarrass you. But I do want to pray for you if you'd allow me to this morning. I'm not sure. Would you pray for me? Anybody like that? I'm just not sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your honesty. I'm just not sure. Would you pray for me? All right. I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. But as we close this morning, let me just ask one more question. Are we... Applying those four important truths like those four, if you want to say, unimportant ladies did. For, uh, several of those ladies, other than one, we don't even know their name. But yet they teach us a valuable truth on Christianity. Will we apply those truths? Will we use those truths in our walk with Christ, make us better Christians? What will we do with what these ladies have taught us this morning? I trust this morning as we close, if you need to do, make a decision for Christ, you can do so where you're seated. You can use it all. It doesn't matter. But as we sing our closing song or invitation, if you need to be with God, you need to settle something with you, you need to get encouragement somewhere, whatever, use the invitation to do so. You raised your hand and said, I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. I'm going to pray for you in just a second, but here's what I'd encourage you to do. I'd grab the person next to me. And as, first, as soon as we started singing, I'd get out of my seat. I'd grab the person next to me and I'd say, preacher, I, I, wanna, I want somebody to tell me how I can know that from the Bible. And if somebody will show me in the Bible, I'll listen. <laughs> I'm not going to make you. I'm not going to pressure you. I'm going to say this. We have a Bible. The Bible has the answers. If you let us take the Bible, we'll show you how you can know it for sure. Not my way, not the church's way, but God's way. If that's you this morning, we'll ask you if you'd like to do that. We'd love to take the Bible and show you that. Father, you know our hearts, you know our minds. You've seen hands that have been raised. Lord, you've seen the one that said, I'm not sure if I die, I'd go to heaven. Lord, give them the courage to even today. Step out and say, if somebody will show me in the Bible, I, I, will, I will listen, I will accept, I will trust. Uh, and I will allow somebody to tell me how I can know heaven is my home. Lord, give them the boldness and the courage even today to seek us out and to allow the Bible to be shown to them. Father, I pray that you'll be with other decisions that might need to be made in our hearts. Lord, if, they, uh, if they're there and they're real, help us to make them today. Help us to apply these four truths from these ladies, Lord, in our hearts and our lives today, we pray. Lord, thank you for it. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Would you go ahead and stand with me this morning as we close our service and just a verse or two of invitation. Lord, I'm coming home. The invitation is open this morning. I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The past of sin too long I've trod. Lord, Never more to 
Amen. I want to remind you just a couple of things as we dismiss this morning. It's not in your bulletin, but we usually recess our service on Sunday nights for Mother's Day so you can go and enjoy the afternoon with your mother without having to worry about, can I make it back to the choir practice for church, okay? Take the afternoon, take the evening, and enjoy your family. And we appreciate uh, you mothers as well, so please do that. And so if you come at 6, the lights will be off, and I will be at my house. Don't knock on my door because I will not answer. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, 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 so choir practice Wednesday night, uh, so remember that if you would. Um, so remember that, and then ladies, again, if you're a mother, I'm going to be at the back, and I'd love to uh, give you a gift on your way, as well as our visitors. If you've got your card, I'd like to give you a gift, so I'll be right back there and meet you. Look forward to doing that. Let's have a word of prayer and close. Uh, it is wonderful to have the Pettits with us this morning. If you didn't see them, they're sitting right over here, and she is still putting up with him after all these years. And uh, Brother Lyle, would you close us in a word of prayer this morning, please?